To some extent, we're continuing where we, uh, we're we looking at part of chapter, uh, all of chapter 25 and part of chapter 26 last week, and now we're going to sort of blend forward and, and complete chapter 26. So I'm going to read that chapter, then pray, and then together we'll dig in and open God's Word. So listen as I read Acts chapter 26. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it's before you, King Agrippa, that I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship day and night. And for this hope, I am accused by the Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Verse 9. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues. And I tried to make them blaspheme in raging fury against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here to testify to bo uh, both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophet and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind or mad. And Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. The king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am except for these chains. 
Then the king arose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Let's pray. Lord, once again, as we open your word and we just sense the, the, the richness, the breadth, and the power in it. Lord, we're thankful for this remarkable testimony of Paul as he did so before Festus and Agrippa and Bernice where he set forth his hope that is rooted in Christ who suffered and rose again. Lord, I pray that as we seek to con consider these things to today and, and put together some of these pieces clearly in our minds, oh God, I pray you'd help me to speak succinctly and clearly. I ask, O oh God, that you would give everyone you've brought here this day ears to hear, illumine their hearts and minds, and give them understanding in accordance with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there's a lot in that narrative chapter that I read. And, and much of the flow of the themes that are going on in the events are easy for you to pick up just as I read them. And so what we began to do last week and we'll bring to kind of completion this week is we, we began to look at certain things within that that stood out. One of the things that we first looked at was the journey to Rome. And we had seen that interestingly enough, here they're saying at the end of it, if he had not appealed to Caesar, he could have been set free. To which men often rationalize with the seeming brilliance in their own minds that what a mistake Paul blew it he shouldn't have appealed to Caesar he would have gone free now here he is he's going to have to go to Rome but we backed up and we saw even before when he was journeying to Jerusalem he said to the people now I am traveling to Jerusalem then after that I must declare the gospel in Rome also so his plan was already to get to Rome when he was arrested and there were plots to take his life in Jerusalem, God appeared to him in the, in the e evening and told him not to fear or worry because as he has spoken the facts concerning salvation in Jerusalem, so also he must um, and or will do so in Rome. So look, the... The men's rationale says, oh, he shouldn't have. If only he would have done better. He made a mistake. He was too rash by saying, I appeal to Caesar. Well, if he had been set free, what would he have done? Potentially be, been killed, but his goal was to get to Rome. By, so if he had been set free, his intention would be to go to Rome to speak the gospel. By remaining imprisoned because he had appealed to Caesar, what happened? He goes to Rome. So either way, and we, we looked last week a little bit at the remarkable reality of it with all of the enemies arising against him. Men who had actually put themselves, though they didn't keep it, put themselves under a vow, we will never taste food again until we kill Paul. There would have been a lot of starved people had that been the case. But like most vows of men, you know, it's, it's big words and big intentions until it hurts me, you know. As long as it's hurting others, you know, I can sacrifice. But if it starts to hurt me too much, there's hesitation. But what God so worked out in what some look at as Paul's mistake is he gave him armed guard by the Praetorian, uh, the elite royal army, as, all, as well as paid transport to Rome. I mean, it was all taken care of for him. And so what we were able to stand back and see is, look, even in the things that we do with some degree of ignorance, and we may look back on and says, if only I hadn't, all of those seeming missteps nonetheless are part of God's unfolding plans and purposes in our life. 
the vows of men, even the missteps of ours, will never keep God from accomplishing what he has purposed, even personally in our lives. It's a, it's a, a remarkable. Then secondly, he, he got into one of the key themes that he goes into over and over again, and that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the importance of the resurrection. And if Christ isn't raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain, and this is all worthless. But in fact, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And what, it, what that does is it, is it establishes and, and, and sets forth the proof in the person of Christ of the salvation, indeed of all of the promises of God, because they find their yea and amen in Christ. And it gives us that, that certain reality. I mean, there are people who live in this world with, with no sense of what happens when they die. And tragically, some of them lead themselves, deceived by the world, to think, my discomfort, my sadness, my unease, my, my struggles, if my life ended, then those problems would end, where they think it's just a cutting point after you die, you neither think, you neither know, you neither feel, you're done. But the scriptures reveal to us very clearly that is not the case. There is going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. Every, it is appointed for man once to die and after that the judgment. I mean, this is no small thing. And so sadly, some of those who under the, under, under the difficult and tragic circumstances of life think they are to escape our hearts break because we remember Lazarus and the rich man. And that rich man, after he had feasted sumptuously every day on earth, he then died and went to Hades. And in that place, he was tormented and struggling. He just wanted a little bit of water, a little bit of relief. And, and the reality of judgment. And the same thing, remember when Paul was speaking at Athens and giving that gospel to the unknowing. He went to, God has appointed a day to judge the world by a man whom he raised from the dead. And they all began to mock him. And stop listening to him. And, and the tragedy is the world can mock, the world can laugh, the world can disbelieve, but it remains true. Jesus died and rose again. It remains true. There is no salvation except through Christ. It remains true. Everyone at some point will either die or he will come and they will meet him in the air. But everyone will stand before the judgment seat of God. And there's no way around that. And, and so we say that and we share that. And maybe the response of people may be like they did to Paul and mocked him. Even here as he's declaring it to Festus. What is Festus's return or response to what Paul is saying? Paul, you're mad. You're out of your mind, you know, and then maybe blaming, blaming it on too much learning. Well, that's interesting. You know, maybe sometimes the error is too little learning of the scriptures and the truth of God as revealed. I think that that's often the case, and we've seen this before. One of the challenges, and I think what comes to error, and one of the reasons the Pharisees, though they studied with great regularity, were often in error, Jesus confronted them with these words. He says, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. So, so the answer isn't to close your Bibles and, and just to, uh, think on your own while, while walking in the wilderness. It, it, it isn't some sort of self-meditation and find the answer within yourself. That's not it. It, it is know the word of God better. <laughs> And the better you know God's word, the more you'll understand of the power of God and his purposes revealed in it 
and in particular in Christ, who is the living word. And then we saw last week as we move in that there is a, a warning to Paul against resistance. The, the statement that, he, that is woven in there and is particular to uh, this testimony in Acts 26, not in any of the other testimonies, when he says, uh, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Then he says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. And we, we talked last week about the dangerous nature of the goads that if an ox or bullock was particularly stubborn, all he would do is hurt himself more. The farmer with ox goads, plural, is not only going to keep him from going off the path, but then when he kicks back, he's going to kick against the goads, so even that hurts him further and spurs him onward. So he can't stop, he can't go side to side, he is going to be constrained. And so the, the sense of it is like this for an oxen, and I say this with, with a clear sense, who likes to be likened to an oxen? You know, No, I, I get it, me neither, but the sense is, if the oxen goes the way he's supposed to go, you know what happens? Smooth sailing. Ye but when he starts to go to the right, what happens? Goad. You know, and to the left, you get it. And, 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 and it's going to keep going. The, the sense of it is, listen, God is going to accomplish his purposes and so you ought to go ahead and hear it and wisely comply because note this whether it is broad based or whether it is personal and particular God will accomplish his purpose and that's what we began to see last week to some extent was you cannot thwart God he will accomplish all that he's purposed. And I won't go back into some of the verses that we saw last week, but I will just draw your attention to something of another example of that before we move on to a more personal sense. So the first sense of resistance, as we saw, uh, there's a pervasive sense where God is unfolding his purposes. He is the one who rules over the nations. He's the one who puts kings or monarchs on their throne he's the one who removes them off nebuchadnezzar thought he was on the throne by his own power wisdom and might he thought by his own glory and acumen that he had achieved all that he had but then what did he find out in the middle of his boast and we're oft familiar with this because this is one of those things that jumps out to when you're even mildly attentive to the reading of God's word. It says, while the words were still in his mouth. What happened? From being in his own estimation, the absolute pinnacle of mankind. He was in an instant no better than a beast. He had not the brain power. He had not the hygiene. He had not any of the other facets that are ordinary to even lesser men. And he was then a beast for seven years. Until what? God was pleased to restore to him his sense, restore to him his throne, restore to him the glory that he previously had, and then he understood what? Huh, all that I am and all that I have and all that I've achieved, far be it from me to think it was me. He is the one who establishes. He is the one whose kingdom is from generation to generation. And he, he got that sense. Now, there is a case also in um, Isaiah 
uh, chapter 37, uh, which is a parallel to 2 Kings chapter 19. And that is, and all, all come from different church backgrounds, so sometimes Old Testament names become messy. So some know them as Sennacherib, some as Sennacherib, some as Sennacherib for those more Hebrew inclined. The, but we know that he had come and he had sent his spokesman and they were mocking Hezekiah and they were mocking the God of Israel. What God has been able to li- deliver you? What God has been able to protect? My father ran across all these other gods. I've run across all these other nations and their gods. What makes you think your God is any different? Well, (laughs) that's a mistake. And actually, what's amazing is as they went in and and laid this before the Lord in prayer, it tells us this in Isaiah 37, verse 29. It says, uh, because you have raged against me and your complacency has come to my ears. That That is this prideful overconfidence, not the way we modernly use complacency. God says this to him. I will put my hook in your nose. Okay, now does that sound like who's controlling where this man is about to go? And he's thinking, no, 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 I'm a man, you're God. You can't and dare not impinge upon my free will because I get to go where I want, do what I want because I'm a man. Praise be to man. Is that how it works? Men often think that's how it works. And tragically, God at times let men follow the desires of their own hearts and minds. That ought to be the last thing we want when we're apart from Christ. He says to this man, I will put a hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth. That's strong language for you're going. You know, I'm directing you and I am pulling you. To which you can think, this king gets that that kind of information, what's he thinking? Yeah, we'll see. Try it. Hezekiah is just saying this in order to pump up his people, to give them confidence. But he's not done here. He says, and I will turn you back by the way in which you came. Then it tells us down in verse 36, also further, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 of his soldiers that night. Boom. They wake up the next day, dead bodies all around. It says, when the people rose early, behold, there were all these dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and returned home. Now, people will look at that. Well, because his army was devastated... He decided to go home. Yes, but who was orchestrating all of those things to bring him to that determined decision? God. So was it, was it God's decision that he would go back by the way he, would come, he came? Or was it Sennacherib's decision to go back to where he had come from? And in the mystery of our minds, we end up saying, it was actually both of their decisions. And God so orchestrated by his power, the circumstances, and even with whatever remained there, the, the uncertainty, the fear, the doubt, that he, was, he did not even, as it said earlier, he will not even enter this city, he will not lay a siege, he will not throw an arrow into it. God just ended it like that. And so when we see that, it's like, wow, that is powerful. Go on further with me and let's, let's take this and see just how personal this can become. And we've seen it, it was personal that, that God's purposes for Paul, and, and these purposes are, are both related to salvation as well as they're related to his role in ministry as well as they are also related to all of the practical experiences and places he finds himself in life. God's particular providence. 
all of those things are under the purvey of God's power. For example, that he was going to go to Jerusalem. Who had decided that? God had told him to go there and constrained he went. That he would be going to Rome. Who is guaranteed that that's going to happen? God has. That when he was on his way to Damascus, was he seeking Jesus as his Savior? No, we know very clearly. His goal, even he stated in this chapter, in going to Damascus was to do everything he could in opposition to Christ. So here he goes in raging fury and opposition to Christ. He's going and what happens? His plan was to end the name of Christ in Damascus. And what, ha- what does he end up doing? Declaring the name of Christ in Damascus. First in Damascus. Wait a second. So his willful plan and intention was destruction, but God's design was declaration. How did God work that out? Well, God revealed Christ to him on the road there was a remarkable divine revelation that had been that that was his specific appointment look at look at a few verses that I just draw your attention to Uh, um, the the sense of this first of all is you will come to me in Jeremiah 32 verse 39 speaking of the new covenant one of the things it says in in verse 39 which sometimes people don't get all the way to because we pick and choose little portions (laughs) Uh, it's good to keep reading. It's good to read what precedes and read what follows. Here's, here's a beautiful statement. Listen to what it says in Jeremiah 32, 39 of God's powerful working in the new covenant. I will give them one heart and one way. So what's going to happen? Some people had hearts after this, and some people had hearts after that. Worldly ambition, worldly pleasure, world, money, accomplishment, pride. Uh, hearts going in all directions. But what's God going to do? Give them one heart. And that heart that is fixed upon Him. We, we love the way that it's stated uh, uh, earlier in Jeremiah 31 as well as when you get to Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 that I will put my spirit within them and I will write my law on their minds and on their hearts so where their their desire was to live for self or whatever it may be now what is their desire to live for God in obedience to him I will give them one heart and what? One mind, uh, that's there as well, but it's one way. I like that because it, 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 sometimes hard to see that as fragmented as the seeming Christian church is today, but it ought to be about one way. The gospel as given to us in the scripture and the truth of God as revealed to us. I love the fact that even in this passage, one of the things that Paul does say right here in the middle of it, right in verse 22, he says this, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. All that is in the scriptures. Listen, it's all about a commitment to God's word. Then he goes on to say, still Jeremiah 32, 39, I'll give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and for the good of their children after them. So, wait. My heart wanted to do this. Let's say I'm Paul. Destroy the name of Christ. God's plan was for me to be his servant and declare his salvation and to promote the name of Christ. He took what was in my heart and gave me a different heart, a new heart. He took out the heart of stone and put it in a new heart. And and now this new heart has a new way 
And someone might for a moment rise up and say, I don't feel comfortable about that. God kind of removing my old heart and giving me a new heart, changing my way to His way. That's kind of getting in my business. Uh, It says, for your good. Who's generally against that? You know, I mean, it used to work. You know, as as the years go by, examples I heard growing up in church can't be used anymore. You know, they pour the medicine and say it's good for you. <laughs> the the smell and taste of that medicine was almost untakeable, but you took it in your illness because they said it's good for you. You, some of you remember those days. Some of you did not. You grew up on Flintstones vitamins and, and where every, you know, after the one spoonful, you're like, can I have another spoonful of that medicine? Can I just take the bottle? Because, it, you know, it's changed. And so uh, the, the sense is, and, and I guess th- that's kind of the sense. What seemed like at one point, no, nah, no, nah, this wouldn't be good for me. No, nah, no, nah, this wouldn't be desirable. Now it's, it's completely changed. This is desirable. This is what I want. This is what I want. Give me more. It's good medicine, in a sense. Um, uh, scripture says, Things such as this, Psalm 110, verse 3. Your people will offer themselves freely in the day of your power. (laughs) You know what happens? We may be resistant to a point, but when the day has come that God has determined to make known his power, like happened on the road to Damascus, you know what happens now? You're willing I love the language here when you put together the, 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 the different, uh, in Acts 22, the, the account of his testimony, one of the first things that Paul says after he says, I'm the Lord whom you are persecuting, his response is this, oh, what will you have me do? Hmm, you wanted nothing to do with him, <laughs> and now you want to know what he would have you do. That's a remarkable change. How long did that take? It was instantaneous. And because it was by the power of God invading and gloriously altering his will, he did so with absolute, uh, all resistance is gone. That's why we speak of the grace of God saves sinners. I mean, this, it's, it's a beautiful reality. This was the day of grace to be poured out on Paul, and it was revolutionary from who he was to who he is. Some of the scriptures that give this sense, which I don't have time to unfold them today, but for those who have studied these things, they'll warm your hearts. For those who haven't, hopefully it'll scratch you a little bit to... to I want, I got to understand this a little clearer. I got to study a little bit more. John 6:44, Jesus says these words, "No one can come to me unless the Father draws him." He's saying that to a bunch of resistant people. And rather than Jesus beating himself up like someone might these days and say, "Oh, I can't convince them." Oh, I'm just not effective as a, as a communicator or a minister. Oh, I can't. No, Jesus, he, he understands how it works. We oft don't. And remember, be careful, we are not Jesus. Jesus, you know, Jesus said he knew what was every, in every man's heart, so on one occasion he did not entrust himself to them. We don't know what work God may or may not be doing in the hearts of men while we share the gospel with them. But we know that no matter what was going on in their life before, and don't buy into this notion, sometimes in the patience of God, God, is, God brings 
people through a journey of showing them the uselessness of this, the hopelessness of that, bringing, uh, taking away any sense of pride and self-value to where they seem broken, and then he reveals his love in Christ and, and fills them with joy. And so sometimes he brings them through a season and, and a journey of difficulty. That's not always the case. And note this, God does not need that in order to somehow get them to the place where he can save them. I mean, we've got to be careful not to think like that. Because what did, what did Paul go through? Saul. I mean, he was on the rise as a leader of the Pharisees. I mean, he had, for his age, seemingly taken the top rung. The only thing that might have kept him from being a future chief priest is the fact that that was all done politically by family. As the world then, thankfully the world's changed. Um, still in John six forty four, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. And then it explains, well, what, what does this mean? How does, how, no one can come. How many does that leave? Uh, no one. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, unless the Father draws him. Well, how does he do that? Well, it, he explains a sense of that in the next verse, John six forty five. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Whew. So Listen. I can and you can share the gospel with someone. And not only can, we should. We really should. We're called to do that. But our sharing isn't going to save anyone by our words or our power. Indeed, it's designed so that this treasure is in clay jars, earthen vessels so that it's known that the power is not in us. But, so we share, but two hear. One hears with the power of God, teaching him, bringing him understanding. And the other hears and doesn't understand and rejects. And, and I, and I want to make this very clear. You want to know what's made the difference between one and another? The power of God. Why do I say that? Because both of them were sinners. Both of them were unworthy. Paul even calls himself the chief of sinners. Even feeling unworthy to be called an apostle because of all that he's done. But he understood he was an apostle. Why? By the appointment of God. Again, for some reason, our clocks are moving quickly. Um, listen to what it says. The beautiful words of John 6. And I'm going to try to just mostly read them without much explanation. Because sometimes the reading is clear enough. But the reading excites me so much that it's hard to just move on. So we'll do our best. John 6.36 but I said to you, you have seen me and yet do not believe me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Hmm. So here they are, a bunch of them. They're seeing him, they're hearing him, and you know what they're doing? Rejecting him. And what is Jesus saying? I get that, I see that, I know that, I'm not worried about that. Because all the Father gives me will come to me. And somebody says, well, how do I know if I've, I'm given to him? Do you want to come to Christ? Do you want to turn from your sin? Do you want him to, to absolutely radically transform all that you are so that you love Christ, so that you long for his return, you, lo you long to live for him? Do you desire that? Listen, then Jesus, his very next words are, all who come to me, I will not cast out. So here's the question. Do you desire to come to him? Then come to him. Run to Christ. And you will find, no matter what you were, 
he will receive you in himself as you come in faith and repentance. And we'll see how that remarkably plays out. So he says, um, all my father gives, and whoever comes I will not cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. I shall lose none of all that he has given me. So how many of the sheep of the great shepherd will be lost? He came to seek and save that was lost, correct? He calls his own sheep, John says. He calls them by name. He knows them and they know his voice and they follow him and he gives them eternal life. And when he has brought out all his own. How many will be lost? I will not lose any that my father has given me, but raise them up on the last day. But I, don't, I can't look at somebody and know if they're his sheep or not. No, you can't. How do you know that this grace has been at work, at work in one by the power of God? It says it here in verse 40. For this is the will of my father. Everyone who looks upon the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. So people get, they, they get caught up in the complexities of theology, which is actually very rich and humbling. But the reality is this. If you want to come to Christ, you want to be saved, you want to be delivered of your sin, come to Christ, He will have you. Indeed, if God's grace and power isn't at work, you likely will not desire to come. Do you know why? Because no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. Well, how do I know that he has drawn me? In the hearing of the gospel, do you spiritually apprehend and perceive the glory of God and the person of Christ and believe? If you believe, you are his sheep. Obviously, a lot more I intend to say. It, one thing I will, I'll draw your attention to Galatians uh, chapter 1. Paul is ta- talking there in verse 13 of this exact circumstance. In my former life of Judaism, I persecuted, one thirteen. the church of God violently tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond all my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. But listen to verse 15. But... When he who had set me apart before I was born. What? Now some might think, all right, if God set him apart before he was born, then how did he at any point become such an adversary to the cause of God in Christ? Because remember, God's ways are not your ways and my ways and his thoughts are not ours. He had set me apart before I was born, but then the verse goes on to say, who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son. The plan was established when? Before I was born. It unfolded in my life when he called me by his grace and revealed his son to me. Oh, what power. What a, what a wonderful, remarkable working of God. And not only that, in order that I might preach the, uh, his name among the Gentiles. I also like that because what's Paul going to do? He's going to preach the gospel among the Gentiles. If you, if you read enough of Paul, you'll realize Paul loved his people. A Jew of the Jews committed. He, he says, in, you, you're probably aware, in Romans 9, the shocking language in Romans 9, 3, I, I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. It means he cared so much for his fellow Jews that he's voicing, if many of them would be saved... I'd be willing to be cursed that many of them might be saved. That's how much of a heart he had for the Jews. In, in uh, Romans 10, it says, Brothers, my, verse 1, My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. 
So this is his heart's desire. But then as you read the scriptures, what do you find out? Verses like Timothy tell us this. For I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher to the Gentiles. So (laughs) his primary ministry was where? among the Gentiles. Actually, we see that even when he went to each place, he would go into the synagogues. And how did that usually work out? Utter rejection. And so I I find it interesting that if, if you were to have, and I were to have in some sense, set down Paul and say, all right, Paul, uh, I'm going to give you a survey to assess where your heart is and then assign you to the ministry that is fit for your heart. You know, Jews or Gentiles? What's he saying? Jews, you know, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, or you want to go to Rome? (laughs) All the way down. And what I find interesting about that is the likely plan and desire that would have been Paul's is not the purpose that God had for him. It was a different design. I mean, uh, so, so much so that he says this in 1 Corinthians 9. Now, there's so much more. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, he says this. For if I preach the gospel, verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no grounds for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. And I, I, I wish that we would hear those kinds of words. Necessity is laid upon me. Listen to what he says. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. I mean, Paul, do you have a heart for the Gentiles? Do you have a heart for the Macedonians? Well, you know, I'm kind of more interested in the Jews. You know, I find it interesting just because in the history of going to missions classes and this and that, you si- sometimes meet an individual who says, well, yeah, I'm interested in going to this country. And in this country, in this region of the country, there's this people group that's in this religion, and those are the ones that I'm really interested in. Well, um, good, they need the gospel too, but how about this? All along the way, you share the gospel. And when they throw you out, you go somewhere else and you share the gospel. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Listen, he says this. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I'm still entrusted with a stewardship. Here he's kind of saying, kind of like it or not, no matter what, this is what I'm going to be doing. If I do it wholeheartedly, God is going to reward me for my faithful service. If I... Do it reluctantly and resistantly. One of the shocking things is this. I'm going to still be doing it. There ain't no way for me to stop that. A stewardship is laid upon me. This is what's going to happen. I guess I, I, as it says in Psalm 57, verse 1 and 2, be merciful to me, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I take refuge. Till the storms of destruction pass by, I cry out to the most high God, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. You and I are not Paul. We don't have to be. Not everyone has the same gift. Not everyone has to be the next world-renowned individual. There need to be faithful, earnest individuals in big cities and in small towns, in large churches and in small churches. The standard of God's word and the commitment to his truth, the value of his gospel and the power of God is not different or diminished by distinct locations. We need to render to God all that we have and all that we can. Brothers and sisters, there's a few more rich things that I long to unfold in this. And so we are going for part three next Sunday. All right, let me pray and then we will uh, sing together and then uh, spend a brief time in prayer. Lord, I just thank you so much for your word and just the opportunity for us to come together and glory in you. Lord, when we begin to hear these things, 
your word speaks of our salvation powerfully and we thank you that it is rooted in a faith that is in the person and work of Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, we thank you for his perfect, obedient life and the righteousness that he has accomplished and that is counted to us because of him. Lord, we just also, uh, uh, when we think of our experience of it, uh, to contemplate the mystery of the reality that you had set us apart for yourself before we were born. That in the course of time and oft after some very difficult journeys and experiences, your grace was revealed to us as you granted us in the hearing of the gospel to perceive, to understand, to apprehend and comprehend the rich reality of the gospel in Christ and to repent and believe. Lord, even as next week we will take up with a clearer sense to understand uh, the strength and scope and significance of this concept of repentance. I just pray that you would warm our hearts uh, with the rich privilege we have those of us who are in Christ, if there are any here who know not your salvation, oh Lord, that, that they would be stirred, that, that they would feel within their heart by the working of your power a desire to come and know you. And Lord, we thank you that as we've come by your grace to know you, it is by your grace that we know you. It is by your grace we gather here today and because of your good purposes that we're able to worship you. We give you all praise and glory and we thank you for your word. Oh God, enlarge our hearts, inflame our hearts when we think of these things. In Jesus' name, amen.